over to you. I'm going to pop you on as the presenter. And then you can take it away. Okay. Cool. Well, hopefully you're seeing the right screen. So a health research and extension update from your neighbors in New York. It's a pleasure to be here and I wish it was in person because um, this um, virtual world is, is not as fun as interacting with people in person. But um, just a little background, I'm an extension associate um, in Harold Van Ness's lab in the Cornell Soil Health um, program, and we work closely with the Cornell Soil Health Lab. So today um, we're going to be kind of doing a whirlwind tour of, of an introduction to the lab and interpretation framework. Um, some recent work we've done to character, characterize soil health across um, soil texture and cropping systems. And then a little bit on some things that are on the horizon, some benchmarking and some case studies um, that we can look at. So for Soils 101, you probably don't need this, but as a good reminder, soils have inherent and dynamic soil quality. This is one of my favorite soil profiles, Hagerstown soil from, from Pennsylvania. It's this gigapan, very high resolution. But basically, inherent soil quality is a result of a location's unique combination of minerals, climate, biology, relief, and time. And these are things that we're stuck with that, that we can't change, really. And these dynamic soil qualities are the changes due to human use and management. And when we're talking about soil health, we're really talking about these dynamic and anthropogenic aspects of soil quality. So here's a good example of that. So soil health focuses on the dynamic and human caused aspects of soil quality. As an example, these are both the exact same soil series of Buxton Silt Loam in New Hampshire. And on the left, you can see Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so yeah, soil health focuses on the dynamic and human caused aspects of these, and we can see um, very different soil health with the exact same soil series. Very high in organic matter on the left, um, and very compacted and low organic matter on the right. Um, but our standard soil tests and interpretations are only based on the chemical parameters of soil. So these, these, this one actually says that the one on the right is better, maybe because um, it has a more optimum pH or um, potassium is in, uh, probably not potassium, but some, something's in a better range on the right-hand side. But we know that there's a lot missing here in terms of how these soils are actually functioning, which is what soil health is about, how they're taking in water, how they're storing carbon, um, providing habitat for organisms, et cetera. So the importance of soil health, um, soil's ability to, to function and provide services really comes from two angles, um, both in the agricultural realm through, through the agricultural products that we receive um, from ecosystems, and then also this, and this plant animal health and nutrition angle. And then more and more, um, we we're, we're really want to know more about the ecosystem services that soil are providing, both in terms of water, carbon, um, and, and climate. So this is another big one. And more and more, we're, we're realizing the scale that humans are having on uh, being a soil forming factor and, and degrading soils. So to recap this, this definitely maybe what you could call renewed interest in soils um, is driven by this renewed recognition that soils are critical for, for food, water, biosphere, climate, and we're increasingly having a stronger effect on them. So in 2006, quite a while ago, um, Harold Van Ness and um, other faculty, plant pathologists, soil ecologists, 
agronomists came together um, to try to identify um, the best um, and cheapest, most sensitive parameters um, for assessing these biological and physical functions um, that were really missing from our from our view of, of what soils look like. So this report on the right, which you probably many of you are familiar with, is what um, the report currently looks like. The lab has processed a, a large amount of samples over, over this time, and it's allowed us to do a lot of really um, big, it's nice big data work on, on these samples and, and cash framework as an example and is widely recognized across the globe. Um, so the point of these soil health tests, we know as soil scientists, it's very difficult and expensive to measure processes in the field. So the point of these indicators are to link to essential soil processes in the field that we want to know about. So here are the physical, aggregate stability is an indicator we can measure in the lab, but gives us some information about some underlying soil processes, the resistance of the soil to disperse. Um, if the soil is not resistant to disperse, then you get some aeration and crusting issues and some infiltration issues. Um, we have available water capacity, which tells us how much plant available water a soil can hold on to. And then the only one that's measured in the field is the surface and subsurface compaction, um, zero to six inches and six to 18 inches. You see this person doing on the right. Um, some of the biological indicators we look at, organic matter, some people might not um, consider that necessarily a biological indicator, but really, um, our, our, our interpretations of organic matter have really been inadequate, basically non-existent from, from labs because it requires, um, um, requires a little bit of sophistication to do that. But soil organic matter is obviously the, the heart of the soil for water, nutrient storage, long-term, and, and carbon sequestration. And then basically these three other indicators were identified as, as easy to measure, um, sensitive to management, indicators that were much more sensitive to management. So time and time again, we see that these three indicators in research trials are more sensitive to management than the total soil organic matter pool, which we know is, is very big and um, takes, takes a long, long time to change. So chemical indicators, we won't go into much because those are standard and um, there's been a lot that's gone into this. So I, won't, I don't wanna spend much time in this, but with this soil health testing approach, we are starting to measure more parameters. It gets more expensive. We're looking, at, looking for more information. So it becomes even more and more important than your standard nutrient test to really um, be thoughtful and intentional about, about what questions and what type of information you're, you're trying to get from your system. So here's an example where maybe we're, we want to ask, what are the differences in the effects of a two-year no-till and a two-year plow till on soil health in these same, same soil types? And then as it's important with uh, nutrient, so um, soil fertility testing is we need to stress taking a good sample representative zero to six inch sample is what we use. Someone might use zero to eight inch, but as soil scientists, we need to keep stressing this garbage in, this garbage out. So especially um, with all the emphasis and interest in comparing against treatments and trying to track over long terms, this becomes really important and also providing good interpretation. So measuring soil health in the lab, um, I'm just gonna go through this quickly of what these indicators are, chemical, biological, and physical. Chemical, we won't talk, touch on, includes extractable nutrients and pH, um, and soluble salts and heavy metal add-ons as well, depending on um, which situation you're in. 
soil texture um, is is a unique part of the not a unique part but an important a critical part of the Cornell soil health test because it's really key for interpretation it's what I might describe as the most important inherent soil property the most important information to be able to interpret the other pieces of information afterwards so this percent of sand silt and clay and we know that the percent sand silt and clay influences nutrient storage carbon storage amount of water that a soil can hold on to plant available water so it can hold on to infiltration etc cetera, etc cetera. So this is key for interpretation. So wet aggregate stability is probably, I would say, come to the surface as one of the most important um, physical soil health indicators. And it also integrates information about biological processes because we know that fine roots, mycorrhizal fungi, decomposition processes, polysaccharides are all really important for helping maintain these aggregates. So this is how we, we measure in the lab is basically use a 250 micron sieve, sprinkle some aggregates on the top, and have about a half inch of, of rain on that over five minutes, and we measure the extent to which those aggregates resist falling apart. Unstable aggregates will fall through this filter and can be measured. And as I mentioned before, this is the indicator that, that relates to those soil processes of soil sealing, surface sealing compaction, drainage, um, and, and water storage as well, and resilience. Okay, so surface and subsurface hardness. This is, this is a, a really good one to do in the field. It is tricky or can be useless if there's a high amount of rocks in that field. But um, this, is, this is a good one um, because it's a great field tool to poke around and, and see where cloud pans are, um, et cetera. And we, from research, we know that root growth is about, is reduced above 300 PSI. And it also requires field capacity soil. So as your soil gets drier, it, it gets harder as well. So having, trying to normalize that field capacity is an important thing to do. So soil organic matter, you are all familiar with this, it's just me measured the total amount of organic matter in the soil sample that's measured by loss on ignition measures everything living dead and stable organic matter in the soil. But the methods for this kind of differ by state, like nutrient extractions, we're kind of stuck with these. This is what we use in New York State, 500 C for two hours, and then convert the LOI into organic matter by, by, by an equation. So I think more and more, especially as we're getting more interested in, in talking about carbon sequestration, carbon credits, um, um, ha um, ha influencing and having programs that try to get carbon where it needs to go in, in more degraded and lower, and lower carbon fields, we're gonna be wanting a more precise measurement of, of that carbon. And, these have been around, but they're probably getting better. The one that we have at Cornell is, is really nice because you don't have to do the tin rolling, which we all hate, and you can also have a little bit larger sample size. Um, so this is a, um, a more accurate method of assessing um, sort of the soil organic carbon than, than just soil organic matter. Um, that's not important for now. And active carbon has been around for a while. Um, basically was designed for agricultural sites and is the fraction of soil organic matter that's readily available energy source for the soil food web. Um, and it's much more sensitive than changes in total soil organic matter. It represents about one to five percent of, of that total soil organic matter pool. And because it's more sensitive to management, potentially can be a good leading indicator for that directionality of change that we're seeing in the system. Soil respiration is another uh, really good soil health indicator, measure of the metabolic activity of the soil microbial community after wetting. Um, 
and greater CO2 release is indicative of a more active soil microbial community or greater potential if disturbed. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We had a little bit of introduction um, into the Cornell soil health methods. And now we're going to um, get a little bit larger scale and talk about some of the effects of, of a really important key in inherent soil property, soil texture, and then cropping system on, on soil health. This is a large study we undertook, or not study, but um, data mining project we undertook, about seven, 1,750 samples um, from 2014 till the present um, from across New York State. You can see that, that certain counties, especially where there's more agriculture, um, have more samples because there's more agriculture there. So this was zero to six inch samples from across the state and from a range of different soil textures. We won't get into this map so much, but interestingly, you see that um, we have our coarse textures in New York State. Um, in the locations near to the lakes, Lake Champlain, Lake Ontario, and then also in the Hudson, Hudson Valley. Um, but this big question was, well, how does soil texture influence these soil health properties? And we have a really um, good data set to be able to ask those questions. And this is kind of textbook, what you might have seen in, a, in, a, in your soils textbook the effects of soil texture on the ability of the soil to hold on to plant available water. We can see that the silty loam soils are, have, the, have the optimum of available water capacity. And with, in this recent analysis, we saw that, that available water capacity is one that's really easy, that's much easier to model because of its strong texture. We've actually, the lab has actually moved to model this instead of measure it because with texture and organic matter you can get a good pretty good prediction okay so these biological indicators by soil texture we talked about before these finer textured soils are inherently able to store more soil organic matter reactive organic carbon and are more biologically active than coarse textured soils um, so we see that here and we know from the literature that these fine silt and clay particles um, provide the soil with, with um, some ability to stabilize um, to stabilize organic matter against decomposition. Um, and you can really see that here. So this is this would actually form in the kind of how the scoring functions are now. A 2.5 for a coarse textured soil would get a 50, a score of 50%, whereas a silt loam would get um, with that same organic matter would get a B scoring much lower because it's it's much lower than the mean for silt loans. Okay, and then the much more novel part of this study is to ask um, what are the large effects of these different cropping systems on soil health? So we picked out um, basically grouped, made five groups of cropping systems by grouping crop codes that you probably are familiar with, with your um, nutrient submission sheets. We had an annual grain group, corn, soy, wheat, corn silage group, corn silage and alfalfa crop codes, pasture crop codes, mixed vegetable crop codes, and then crop this vegetable crop codes. And this was an important distinction for us to make because these mixed vegetable farms are areas maybe of acre or two where you're growing a diverse array of crops mostly it'd be like a fresh market farm or organic vegetable CSA or something like that. And then these processed vegetable farms where they're growing cabbage or snap beans, say on, on, on very large plots, um, very large fields. And, and this is really important from, and, and taking a step back and asking the question of why these different cropping systems would differentially affect soil health is an important first step. So first we have our pastures, probably the best case scenario um, for maintaining soil health. We have year-round biomass production where 
where almost all of the biomass that's being produced is being recycled um, in place in the soil. We don't have any disturbance, so those, those root systems and mycorrhizal hyphae are able to remain intact um, all year round. So that ends us with a happy worm. In the, in the most intensive use of our cultural lands when we're growing um, annual, annual grain crops or processing vegetable crops, um, the traditional situation, or the, I guess you could say, would be that if we're in, is that maybe 50 to 70 percent of the carbon and nutrients are being exported in harvest um, from those crops. We're also potentially doing a lot of tillage, um, and only 30 to 50 percent are being returned. And if we're only returning the synthetic nutrients to the soil, we're slowly degrading, degrading organic matter. And somewhere intermediate are our dairy cropping systems which can actually have really great soil health because they have um, the, at least the manure from the feed is returning to the fields. They, a lot of dairy farms have longer rotations where they're rotating through your corn silage, through your alfalfa, and there's even potential that they're importing feed on the farm so they have a net, net you know, input of, of carbon and nutrients onto the farm. And mixed vegetable farms, they're smaller in scale, so they're easier to add a lot, add more organic amendments, and also um, rely on cover cropping quite intensively. So these are maybe these three scenarios for the differences in carbon and nutrient balances and tillage associated with these cropping systems. So let's look at the results of that. We saw that um, that these mixed vegetable farms and pasture pasture as well as dairy slightly a little bit lower, had higher soil organic matter than these annual grain processing vegetable systems. Similarly, with active carbon, especially higher than this processing vegetable system, soil protein, similarly mixed veg pasture, had higher soil protein levels than these annual grain and processing vegetable systems. Soil respiration um, had a strong pasture signal, but and then also dairy cropping had had higher um, than these other systems. And aggregate stability across all these textures. So one thing to mention with this data is now we're just looking at loam soils because we want to compare apples to apples. And though in that this situation, that's loam textured soils and these different cropping systems across those loam textured soils. Aggregate stability with a knife proof of concept across all of these soil texture groups, because pasture, these undisturbed pasture systems by and far had two to three times as much aggregate stability as these other cropping uh, systems. And, and we've all seen that probably at a, at a field day where someone's putting in, doing the slaking test with a pasture soil and then a nearby tilled field and, and demonstrating um, that phenomenon. So when we look at all the data together, we, we, it kind of came out like this as well, that these process and grain systems had the lowest soil health, these dairy crop and mixed vegetable were kind of intermediate, um, and pasture had a little bit higher, had, had the highest soil health. So this is, I think, a really important data set, especially for New York State. Um, we have metrics for, for, for quality standards for air and water, but, but we don't really have these same goals for, for soil. And especially with our um, increased interest in, in um, trying to have soil organic carbon be, uh, be one of the mitigation strategies for combating climate change, we really need to get on top of these and and, and have these targets for farmers to calibrate their management. And these can help target policy efforts as well. But these really need to be adapted to regions. You can imagine that the mean soil organic matter in the southeast is much lower than in the north due to effects of temperature, um, precipitation on decomposition, 
um, and we know soil texture has a strong role. And we also know that they should be adapted to production systems because we can't expect the same soil health levels necessarily from um, processing vegetable farm that's growing acres of snap beans to um, to a livestock pasture system. So what came out of this data set as well is the idea that um, this data set could um, form a foundation for setting aspirational goals. So we, we targeted the 75th percentile. It wouldn't necessarily need to be that, but that's a good, a good uh, middle of the ground uh, upper target. And we have these by the different soil texture classes, sort of soil texture groups that we use. This one's for loam. Um, so this basically means that these are achievable. 25% of the samples from these different groups were able to achieve these levels. And you can see the differences of what a goal might look like for a processing vegetable farm versus a mixed vegetable farm that probably much smaller in, in scale and, and, um, and, and much different. And, um, so that, yeah, this is an exciting aspect. And we kind of know the practices and processes that, that we need to um, implement in these annual grain and processing vegetable systems. And these are these practices that are, are working in the dairy cropping, mixed vegetable, and, and pasture systems. So producing, eliminating tillage, cover crops, just getting more, um, increasing your the amount of biomass that you're adding to the soil every year, perennial sod crops, manure and compost application, integration of these reduced tillage and cover crop techniques. Here's some no-till organic soybeans and some planting green. And we're seeing bio strip till. So these are some exciting practices that can help, help push these annual grain and processing vegetable systems to the next level. Okay, so I'm going much faster than I thought. Um, but characterization of soil health, some key summary points. Soil health results in New York. We've known soil texture is a really critical inherent soil property, but this, this shows it as well and provides some really good interpretation across the soil texture groups. And the more novel aspect of this uh, research is to show the, these really large scale effects of these cropping systems on biological and physical soil health. Um, um, this research helps help to establish new parameters to interpret soil health in New York and potentially can be useful for other parts of the Northeast and similar, similar climate. These aspirational soil goals were established for different soil types and cropping systems. And I didn't talk about the soil carbon potential so I won't go into that. So some next steps, and this, this will be a shorter part of the presentation. Um, I think a really exciting next avenue is, is soil health benchmarking. And then I'll talk about one selected case study. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, we've been really inspired at Cornell um, and have been collaborating with um, with PASA, the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. They just released a really nice um, soil health benchmark um, report. And basically they have a cohort of farmers that all trust and want to um, want to collaborate with each other. Um, so they have kind of enhanced ability to data share because there's there's trust within that cohort. So here's some things that they're doing. They're doing some benchmarking so they're basically showing each farmer where they're at to the cloud of, of folks in in their different type of system and they're also doing something that i think is a, is a really good idea for extension rather than just talking about the soil health results they're also talking about the management practices um, that that would help achieve those soil health goals so these are two of them that they have where they have the farmers basically calculate and um, catalog the organic matter inputs throughout this rotation for those fields 
and also their days of living cover. So then if you get a low soil health result, but your days of living cover is about 150 days, you'd be like, oh, that's that's why I'm, that's that's a that's a um, a place where I can improve and help help improve my soil health. Um, so this is some place that we're hoping to um, adapt on as well and do this kind of in terms of the results we got from that big characterization study in New York State. So here's a a real dairy farm, but we've hidden the data. Um, we'll, so we'll call it Moose Dairy Farm. And here's one of their fields. And this basically allows them to say, okay, now rather than just having it based, the soil scoring based on just loam textures, they can see how the organic matter relates to other, other dairy farms on the same soil texture. So, this, this um, field had higher sort of organic matter than, than the mean, which is a good sign. And, and for aggregate stability, this was really good proof of concept for them because they're avid no-tillers and cover croppers. Um, so showing that this field was maintaining extremely high aggregate stability, much higher than the mean, um, was, was a good proof of concept for their management working. Okay, and the last one, I didn't get too many of these case studies ready, unfortunately, but this was kind of an interesting one that, that shows the value of a soil respiration. And I can say that I've seen all sorts, all certain types of reports and there's um, in all certain types of soil health research with these indicators. Um, and each one can be useful in one, in one, in, um, more or less useful in, in, in certain situations. So this was somebody that was doing contrast sampling between a pasture field that was adjacent to a field that they were just about to, just had prepped to grow blueberries. Um, and I thought this was interesting because um, things were um, pretty similar, but I've seen this a lot in data where low soil pH is really tanked tank the soil respiration. And I don't think this is necessarily a problem for this um, field, but shows the relationship between these processes, of soil pH and respiration. Um, blueberries are interesting because they're, they're, they have their own type of mycorrhizal fungi and are probably ha have their AMF to maybe because mineralization is, is gonna be slower in that environment for accessing nutrients. But this is just one one case study. So I guess now um, I'll thank you all and mention that we have these reports available. Um, Harold Van Est just finished, just published his fourth edition for Building Soils for Better Crops. So if you don't have your new edition, you should download that. And if you're interested, we're offering a certificate course led by Harold and, and faculty in, in the department um, from December 5th. 14. So if you're a professional, that might be a good fit for you. But thank you so much, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph. So if people have questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the either the chat or the questions box on the right. It's probably on the right side of your screen, your little go-to webinar box. Um, if you're having any trouble with that, go ahead. I have my phone on my side here, so you can also email them to me if you're struggling with the go-to webinar platform. Um, but Joseph, I do have a few to get us started. Uh, so one is, do the Cornell guidelines for interpretation account for the differences in soil texture? So I guess when you get your your results back, are those tailored to your soil type? Or texture yeah. rather. Yeah, they're all based on soil texture currently. And this next level of research is um, to so th they're they're currently based on a coarse medium and fine scheme. Those groupings are shown what they mean in the in the manual. But um, yeah, basically if your organic matter is um, you can see here, if this was a coarse textured soil, a, a, score, a soil organic matter of 2.3, 2.5 would, would probably be in the ballpark of a 50% rating because that's roughly the mean. Um, but here for a loam or silt loam soil, 
a 2.3 is 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 not good. So that yeah, th that is incorporated. Okay, great. Um, so I guess that for us, for as ASPs, mean that we don't have to add on our own layer of interpretation relative to soil texture. It's already done for us, which is yeah. great. Um, so another question is when you were showing the intermediate systems, uh, and is I think the question is getting at: Do you have for like a dairy farm that you said is an intermediate, is that an average of the different fields? So like an average of a pasture and a hay field and a silage field, which you might find all of in a dairy system. No, it is, um, so you'd have to, when we were making these groupings, we were careful to think about that. Um, a pasture would, would be a, a long-term pasture. Um, for dairy cropping, we'd be looking for signs that we have both the alfalfa and corn silage crop codes in there um, together. But of course, there's different parts of the rotation. And after three years of corn silage, maybe your soil health is a little bit lower than at, when it's coming out of the three year of, of um, perennial forages. And we, we can assess that. We kind of just did this big macro level analysis of what these when we look put in all the different data and we know that there's a huge amount of diversity in all these systems there's cash crop farmers that that are avid no-till and cover croppers um, there's processing vegetable farmers that are really into zone till and, and cover cropping in between those zones and some very advanced practices and then we know that at the bottom side of that there's um there's farmers that are maybe still doing full inversion moldboard plowing um, and not using cover crops. So each of these cropping systems does contain the diversity, which, which is pretty cool that we were still able to see these really macro level effects of, of these different cropping system groups. Great. Um, okay, a couple more. Uh, so the next one is, um, did your assessment of statewide systems in your perennial elements include perennial systems like orchards or vineyards? Yeah, that's a good question. And we actually have a statewide orchard soil health project that we um, worked on this year. We've done a little bit in that area. We have a really good orchard team in New York State, so it's been fun to work with all of them. But that's the next, definitely a next addition, of adding the orchards and vineyards to something like this. For the most part, they kind of come out like pastures, I would say, as a generalization, but um, there's there's some differences in there, for sure. Okay, so that's coming down the pipeline for us, is yeah. the orchards. Definitely. Okay, great. I know there's, I know Massachusetts is looking forward to that. Cool. Um, that, that does sort of lead into the next question, though, is do other states need to form their own surveys to contextualize soil health in their systems and in their soils? So I think in other words, should should all of New England be using what New York has put together or should we be working on our own types of surveys and interpretations? Um, I think that's, um, I guess it depends on the interest. Um, and all along the way, you should be using your expertise to say, oh, does, this, does this make sense? I don't think, I mean, I think a good starting place would be to use what, what we've developed, but, um, and you start to put together more data, um, then you can develop your own interpretation. So I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. But always, I think, um, as we've done through this whole time, we've used this kind of big data approach with this normalized, cumulative normal of distribution functions based on the means and distributions of, of our clouds of data for coarse, loam, silt loam, textured soils. But we've also said, Okay, we just took a sample from a long-term pasture site, or um, or also using our results from research experiments. So I think always um, having an iterative process where you're saying, does this do is do this does this big statistics? I mean, and if the numbers get big enough, then I think it does that kind of naturally. But um, always good to make sure things make sense. We don't want to long-term sod getting a low soil health score that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um okay so i have, I have two 
Oh, did someone oh, come off of you to ask a question? No. Okay, might just be my own echo. Um, uh, let's see. Here's a here's a follow-up question. Here, can you go a little deeper on the case for respiration measurements? It seems like there are many factors that could affect results, but that might not correlate to management practices. Are you seeing consistency across your large data set? Um, yeah, there are a lot of factors, um, and and we really just looked at these at these two big. So I guess you weren't necessarily asking about that, but um, so there are definitely a lot of factors. We know with a lot of these measurements, there's some lab variability, um, but the big, I mean, I think yeah. So it's not we're not measuring respiration in the field, um, which is why I. mentioned for the respiration that greater CO2 is indicative of more active soil microbial or greater potential of disturbance. I think that's something that's happening definitely when we see our pasture or, or maybe a long-term no-till field. We're not measuring intact um, um, in the field soil respiration where we are disturbing the sample, bringing it into the lab, drying it, and then re-wetting it. So potentially there's there's much more availability than there was in the lab than there was um, in the field. So I think it's also because we're um, doing these things in the lab so they can be cheaper than measuring them in the field, we do lose some, some of what's naturally occurring in the field. But I think it's still a very useful indicator. Um, and then another question, and this is this is sort of I know the million dollar question, is um, how should how should farmers or how should farmers and their ASPs be using these samples? Should these be diagnostic? Should we make recommendations based on these, or should we just see these as snapshots? Um, I think they're they're diagnostics. I think I think it really comes back to. Um, asking a really good question um, and yeah so it comes back to asking a good question knowing that these that this isn't your your standard nutrient analysis test that costs fifteen dollars um, that that maybe you do grid sampling with or just put the soil in the bag and try to get a quick answer you really want to um, ask good questions um, so that so that you can go deeper in your understanding and we know that there is there's deeper um there's there's more information out there than that just in soil organic matter um so i i think as diagnostics i i mean it it's very as a soil scientist we know it's difficult to track things through time and and that's what um, people that that's maybe not necessarily have the same soil science background want want to do they want to say okay i want to see some directionality in my um in these measurements due to management and that can be tricky um but yeah i don't know that's a but i think as di as diagnostics um and and the diagnostic also connects to the interpretation so if if you're trying a new management practice and you have and you're doing a little on-farm experiment and after three years or something that's you have higher soil respiration or higher active carbon um, maybe in those fields that are very close together that could be a good proof of concept that, that what you're doing is working and pushing your system in the in the right direction so um, yeah, so I don't think necessarily interpretations. I think we're gonna more and more work also is being done on on mo making models for nitrogen mineralization and using the one day respiration in in models like that. So potentially we could this type some of these indicators will work their way into um, um, nitrogen management and um, precision ag um, nutrient management technologies. But for now, I think a lot of it is based, is diagnostic and helping to understand what's going on in the field. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I have my own question. If that was the last of um, everyone else's question, you uh, thanks, Joseph. You, you took a lot of questions there really quickly. Um, so I'll 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 ask my own, and I I know it's a little bit of another million dollar question, but where do you see the future of soil health going? Because it, it's such a hot topic right now, and um, everybody's trying to get a little piece of it. Do you see this? as moving forward as primarily a research tool? Do you see it becoming a part of, you know, the ASP's farm visit? Where are we going with it in the long run? Yeah, um, so that is a, a big question. I think we're, re we're really refining, um, I mean, even the most basic advancement of starting to provide routine interpretations at each lab across the country for soil organic matter would be that would be amazing and that would help us um get to these goals of of um soil organic carbon sequestration targets and all that those things that people are talking about and care about i mean i think we're probably going to see more soil organic carbon data in the future as a routine measurement um i think I mean, I think it's great that there's a lot of labs across the country because it's it's becoming a more pop useful research tool and it allows people from other disciplines to easily um, apply apply these indicators to their research. Um, but I think, and there's also a lot of really good in-field soil health diagnostic um, protocols and stuff that's ongoing. Um, so I think I think some of these things like the slaking, I mean, the compaction is, is easy to do in the field. So um, and yeah, so I, it it really depends. I think this this approach probably includes more indicators than will be in the future. I bet we'll 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 scale this down. I think MIR is going to play a big role in 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 predicting some of these things, and we're and probably hopefully going to be predicting more more things. Can but you initiate think, us all into MIR? <laughs> yeah, so MIR, oh, sorry, MIR <laughs> is um, mid-infrared um, reflectometry um, reflectance. So basically you're using these, um, yeah, in these middle wavelengths in the middle in the mid-infrared spectra and there's been a lot of really good work recently that that this can be a cheaper way to Get get pretty accurate um, both texture information and and total carbon, total nitrogen information. So some of that stuff I think will um, will help us get more information for at a lower cost. So that's I guess I hope. That's great. Are those the infield probes? The what this person here is using. Uh, or no, sorry, the MIR, are those for the infield assessment or would that be back in the lab? That would be back in the lab probably. So that might be something that every nutrient analysis lab starts. I mean, all this stuff is expensive, but if there's enough demand, I think this stuff becomes important. And I think, I mean, there is, there's a lot of interest um, in, in understanding soil organic carbon levels and, and a lot of citizen science stuff, I think. And with the carbon credits world, we're going to have to be able to monitor and, and confirm, um, confirm quantities that are in the soil, et cetera. So. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another question roll in. So we are we are coming close to the end here. So if any of you are, are sitting on any burning questions, go ahead and please get them in. Um, but this next question is, do you see much value in aggregate soil health scores as opposed to looking carefully at the various dimensions of soil health? Um, I don't really understand that question. So aggregate, I mean, no, so like a total soil health score, is that what they're asking about? Right, because you do get that on the soil test. There's the, the component versus the total. So I think what it's driving at is, I guess, what's a more value, that overall quality score or the component score? Yeah, the more the more I've been involved with this work, the more I, I mean, it it integrates, I guess, everything. So the more reds and yellows and oranges you have on there, you're gonna have a lower score. But I think um, we, I think it really is individual 
parameters. And I guess it depends um, what level of interest the person you're talking to is interested in. If they just want to know, all right, I'm better than 75% of the fields out there in this texture. That's that maybe that's good enough. But um, I think getting into these indicators is is worth is worthwhile. If I mean, if you have have the data, um, especially um, yeah. No, each 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 one is telling you a different story, and and, and potentially different implications for for how the processes are, how the soil is functioning in the field. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I if I don't I don't like to look at the overall score. And I don't think if and you can see even here it's it's masked by these chemical properties. So maybe what a better situation would be a biological score, a physical score, and a chemical score rather than putting them all together. Or I mean, there's people have developed all sorts of um, different weighting systems. Ours is basically unweighted, so you get basically the average of, of all these numbers, and that's what you get. Oh, so it's just the natural mean. Okay. Yeah. If that makes sense. That's that. Yeah, that would be really interesting to see weighted scoring. Although I don't want to be Although the person then, that yeah. proposes the weighting score. No, yeah, be then it gets all the criticism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that was our last question. It's three fifty-six. Um, I'd say speak now or forever hold your peace, but it's my experience that the Cornell Soils Lab responds very quickly to questions, and I don't know how they do it. So um, if you didn't get a question in, I'm sure you can send off an email, um, and I've gotten emails about my own questions about interpretations and what do things mean. Uh, they do a really good job. So, okay, it looks like no one has sent in any more. So with that, we'll say thank you, Joseph, very much for being here today. and taking all of our questions. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure you'll continue to see samples from all of us here in, in New England for at least a little while until we start to get into the business. Cool. Well, nice to talk to everyone and hopefully we'll connect with you in person in the future. <laughs> Thanks everybody.